I'm Dr. Amit Sasani, Allegheny Health Network, Cardiac Electrophysiology. Uh, today we're treating a patient with very symptomatic atrial fibrillation who has been treated with amiodarone. He has a history of chronic kidney disease and has limited antiarrhythmic options and has chosen to undergo atrial fibrillation ablation. Starting with nice clean access means that it's the first part of having a nice clean and smooth case. Uh, so I'm going to obtain vascular access now with direct ultrasound guidance. If I routinely uh, obtain femoral venous access three times in the right groin, um, we deliberately use single groin access, uh, mostly because one, it provides us everything we need from an access standpoint, um, catheter standpoint, uh, but importantly, part of the patient experience piece of things which we thought through thoroughly in our program is that um, that single groin access allows the patient to move his or her left leg, bend that knee, and makes the post-operative bed rest recovery period much more comfortable. And I think that part of the experience is actually important, particularly when we're dealing with complex rhythms. I'm just gonna flush out my sheaths. I routinely give heparin early in the case. And uh, part of that is, uh, I think that some of what we see with clot formation on sheaths is probably traveling from uh, initial vascular access points up into the heart. So we like to heparinize early. As another important workflow point, um, we bolus heparin and don't use drips here. It makes it easier, uh, we think, on our, our staff uh, and easier to manage the ACT during the procedure itself. Now I'm advancing the ice catheter. What that involves is a gentle technique of advancing north to south uh, without feeling resistance. If I feel resistance, I'll pull back and redirect. Uh, that way I know I'm safe, I'm not in a side branch, and now we're in the right atrium. And we're gonna start with our ultrasound imaging. So I always mark first the location of where the hist bundle penetrates in the low right atrium, and that's on ultrasound the junction of the non-coronary cusp and the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve, which is sit about here. Grab that for me. Okay, because this patient has had documented typical atrial flutter, we're also gonna mark the cavo tricuspid isthmus. And his looks anatomically interesting. Uh, Sid, if you can grab that, he's got sort of a thickened echogenic appearing isthmus. There's uh, a bit of a valve back at the IVC junction. And I like to mark the isthmus in multiple locations. So we'll start sort of at a, a, what we suspect to be a middle location. Then I'll come a little bit lateral and have Sid mark that lateral isthmus here. Looks like a very pouchy isthmus today. Okay, so this is not a smooth structure. We anticipate that's gonna potentially create uh, an interesting process to ablate that isthmus during this procedure. This is slightly more medial. Okay, so I, I call this almost the airport runway. You have uh, lateral, medial, and in the middle. So when you then go to do your isthmus ablation, you have your ultrasound map. I should mention that uh, in this particular case, we have the patient on jet ventilation to minimize respiratory motion. And that'll become apparent uh, in the left atrium in particular. This is the coronary sinus osteum. We mark the CS os in every case. And as a baseline, I always start by taking a look in the right ventricle to establish the presence or absence of baseline pericardial effusion. Uh, and here there is no baseline effusion. And that's important, I think, a very important step to do early on. That way, if you ever do see fluid and you don't have an initial sort of pre-procedure, pre-transeptal puncture, look, then you're spending that time worrying if that's an issue that was created during the procedure or if it was present prior to. So having that established, I think, is an important workflow practice in any procedure that utilizes intracardiac ultrasound. We're going to now map the left atrium. So this is the LA. Good. Intraatrial septum here. This is anterior. You start to see the left atrial appendage as I counter the ice catheter. 
just slightly, a quarter turn. And these are all very small movements. Okay, so all imaging with ice are very small movements. Eighth and quarter turns. I'm just clocking through the left atrium now. Okay, so that's the left inferior pulmonary vein. Intraatrial septum, we're going to cross it about this level. One thing that's nice, I think, from uh, utilizing all the technology available to us is that the integration between ultrasound and 3D mapping, I think, makes a huge difference, not only in safety, but also in workflow. And what we're able to do now is we have uh, an image of exactly where we want to cross for this case. And I'm going to have Sid draw that image into our ultrasound map so that we have a target drawn into our map, uh, which will become useful in a moment when I show you our transeptal puncture process. I think the upper vein set is up at about 3 o'clock there, if you want to grab that. More of the intraatrial septum, posterior left atrium. You got that there? Good. More of the LA here. So I, I'm clocking through and drawing a, a volumetric representation of the left atrium. This is more clocking through and more posterior. More posterior. I like to clock all the way through till I see the right inferior pulmonary vein, which I'll show you in a moment. There it is. That's the right lower there. This is the larger spline octorate catheter, 333 configuration. We've hooked up our flush. We've made sure that we're flushing through that central lumen. And I'm going to advance now the octorate into the right atrium. We've been used to using pentaray for most of our atrial and ventricular cases, and we've been pleased um, with the performance of the octoray catheters for a number of reasons that I'm going to show you in just a second here, one of which is um, signal fidelity, which I think has been uh, a very large step forward uh, in advance with the octoray catheters compared to the previous generation pentaray, uh, particularly with reduction of far field signal noise. That's utilizing TrueRef technology, which is an integrated, indifferent electrode in the center of the catheter. The um, other nice advantage that we've found, uh, particularly for left atrial and right atrial cases, uh, is the ease and efficiency of mapping. So obviously, uh, greater electrodes and small electrode sizes uh, with small intra-electrode distances combined with Signal fidelity and noise reduction means that we're able to map very efficiently both the left and right atrium. And so what I'm doing now is I'm getting set up with my right atrial map for my eventual right sided cavotricuspidismus ablation. One nice thing I think with the compliance of the splines is that this catheter is particularly well suited uh, for finding important anatomy, not only coronary sinus, as in this case, but also for the pulmonary veins, which we'll, we'll see in just a moment. We're near the level of the Hiss bundle here. There's a Hiss on uh, F3-4 there. If you can update, please, and measure the HV. Okay, so we marked the Hiss bundle, not only with ultrasound base mapping, but also with our diagnostic octoray catheter. I'm gonna finish creating that right atrial geometry. And I found that, you know, for, for me, Having this set up up front means that whatever we deal with following pulmonary vein isolation, should we induce left atrial flutter, right atrial flutter, we have the chambers of interest mapped and ready to be able to map um, on both sides of the heart as needed. And that way we're not, uh, you know, later on uh, in the presence of a tachycardia. And you know, as all of us who operate and do this for a living know, uh, those rhythms are not always present, stable, can be mechanically terminated. It, it gives us the whole setup to be able to be ready, efficient, and um, able to treat the, best, the patient as best as possible, utilizing all the tools at our disposal. Okay, so this is the anterolateral right atrium here, set up into the appendage. One of the nice uh, features of Octoray is that the shaft visualization allows you to see more than we could see previously with the Pentaray. Uh, and that's very nice from a directional standpoint. So as an example here, I'm going to try to put the catheter uh, out toward the anterolateral tricuspid annulus, um, which is an often area that, that's challenging to reach. And utilizing that sheath visualization, you'll see that I've, I've reached it here. 
um, adding to my map here and creating a, a more full geometry, which allows for not only accuracy, but also placement of our diagnostic catheters. So there's a, a number of different choices of octaray catheters, configurations, and sizes. I found, uh, for me, that this particular larger size and intra-electrode spacing is very well suited for left atrial mapping and ablation. Um, and I think two things, not only coverage and reach, uh, which again allows for efficiency in mapping and, and really creating a high resolution, high point density left atrial map. And uh, you know, I think uh, increments of time that frankly we're not used to uh, from you know, previous generation catheters. Um, but secondly, the spline length I think has two very interesting advantages for left atrial work. One is that um, when you place this catheter in a pulmonary vein, it tends to double back on itself, almost like a reverse umbrella. Uh, and that's a beautiful way, I think, if you have a, left, a pulmonary vein leak or an area that's not been isolated, it, it gives you really a, a, a global view into where that leak is located. If ever you're concerned about whether a signal, particularly in the left superior vein, is real near field signal or far field signal, I find this catheter in most cases has the reach to be able to place a single catheter into the appendage and the vein simultaneously. And that way you can actually uh, perform necessary pacing maneuvers to differentiate near field from far field as needed. So I think there's a couple of, of really distinct advantages with this particular catheter and configuration. So we have our right atrial map built for the purposes that we need. This is for the second part of the case. Because we're heparinized and ready to go, we're now going to perform our transeptal puncture and then map the left atrium. I've uh, been fortunate to have uh, tried and um, utilized just about every transeptal puncture that's available. And this is the one that I've settled on. Um, and this actually, I think, is a nice uh, demonstration of technology integration. I'm going to connect my sheath now for visualization purposes. I think that's also been a nice advance, um, not only for this type of procedure, but also I think for uh, other complex ablation utilizing transeptal puncture. So we're connecting our Visigo sheath now. And I'm going to utilize the ablation catheter, our smart touch catheter, which is already flushed and ready for us to go. I'm going to place that catheter through the sheath. And I'm going to use this catheter now to place the ablation on the target that we drew previously, which is on our ultrasound-based map. So, so far, everything we've done is building on itself. Everything we've done is controlled. Everything we've done is safe. You'll see the ablation catheter coming up now from the IVC into the right atrium. And then you'll see also that that catheter is located on the intraatrial septum right at the target that we drew previously. I'm advancing the sheath now over the catheter. And I'm able to visualize that sheath based on this technology, which is another nice integration piece. And with a little bit of deflection of the sheath now, I'm going to place the ablation catheter on the intraatrial septum close to our target. I'm going to utilize the visualization of the ice catheter to make sure it's coaxial. All right, so we have our ice catheter now coaxial with our ablation catheter, which is on the intraatrial septum. What I'm going to do now is utilize this position, which I've confirmed with ultrasound, to advance the sheath over the ablation catheter. I'm going to confirm with ice where we're located, so it's slightly posterior there. Okay, we're a little bit posterior to the veins here. My ice catheter looks like it's no longer coaxial. Let me release some of that posterior curve. And there's our sheath there. So we've now positioned that sheath on the intraatrial septum. We should be looking at the veins there. Okay, so now we have our sheath positioned where we want it. I'm going to hold the sheath in position. That's going to remove the ablation catheter from the sheath. And now we're going to advance a needle and dilator together through the sheath, which we're holding in position. 
one of the key things I think to becoming a good imaging operator is taking the time to make sure that as you advance the needle and dilator together as I'm doing now, that you're visualizing exactly what you want to see. And when you have the right image, you'll be able to see the dilator opacify the lumen of the Visigo sheath as it comes up into position. And so I'm just gently advancing here. And there's that dilator tip on the intraatrial septum. I'm going to click that into place on the sheath. And then I always confirm with ice before I cross anything that I'm exactly where I want to be, that I'm sure that I'm crossing in a safe location. And I think of all the points in the procedure as you become adept at this, um, you'll become efficient and be able to move through parts of it quickly. This part I think is worth confirming not once but twice before you cross to make sure that you're safe. And I think a smooth transeptal puncture leads to a smooth remainder of the case of left atrial mapping and AF ablation. And we're across, and now with our ice visualization, we know exactly where we are, nice and controlled. No ambiguity about not knowing where we are in the left atrium. We're comfortable that we're in the left atrial body. And I've just gently advanced the dilator. And you'll see on ice now, the dilator just across the intraatrial septum. I'm pulling the needle back now. And I always like to advance the sheath over a wire that provides you a rail. We'll put the wire into the pulmonary veins. So now that I have my wire in the vein and I have my sheath visualized on my map, I'm going to advance the sheath. I'll see it start to opacify, or sorry, darken out that wire on ultrasound. And we just crossed, I just gently advanced the sheath into the left atrium. All right, so what I'm doing now is um, using the octoray catheter to map the pulmonary veins. I usually start with the left-sided veins. You'll see the splines, because they're nice and pliable uh, and have a large reach, will enter those pulmonary veins quite nicely. As I pull back to the vein antrum, we'll record voltage in addition to anatomy. This is underneath at the posterior mitral valve area here. I'm just going to gently deflect. And you'll see the reach of the catheter is quite nice here. So we're at that posterior mitral valve area. And I'm just going to undeflect my sheath. And it'll allow that catheter to travel up the ridge on the appendage side nicely here and define that anatomy for us. I think this is where the reach, this single catheter being able to be both in the appendage and across the ridge into the upper vein. You're starting to see some of that now. So I have part of the catheter across the ridge, part of it in the upper vein, really nicely defining that ridge between the left veins and the left atrial appendage. And that same characteristic, like I said, is, is sometimes helpful for identifying near field versus far field signal recorded within the left upper vein, or in some cases, the left lower vein in the, in the setting of a large left atrial appendage. This is said um, by the mitral valve here. I'm just going to clock the system around here and start to pick up some of that low left atrial anatomy. You'll see how nicely that catheter sits flush on the posterior wall. This is actually a nice example of that here. Beautifully flush placement on the posterior wall. That's why I think that this catheter is particularly well suited for left atrial mapping. You're starting to see it in action here. So as I continue to clock through here, this is nicely sitting on the roof and spanning not only the anterior part of the left atrium, but also that left atrial roof. Once I have that anatomy defined, I'm going to find the right-sided pulmonary vein. So this is now the octoray nicely sitting in the right superior pulmonary vein. You'll see this catheter has nice enough reach to show us that upper branch of the right superior vein. And then as I pull it back, nicely sitting in that lower branch of the same vein. So I, I think the sizing, uh, geometry, and, and pliability of these splines, in addition to its recording properties, really makes it a nice catheter for, a very effective catheter for left atrial ablation. Um, as a side note here, we're up to close to 3,000 points uh, after a short amount of time here. So um, not rushing through this sort of nice, comfortable pace and workflow, and we're still able to collect uh, a lot of information, both anatomic and electro-anatomic voltage-wise. Here's the catheter in that right lower vein. This is a lower branch of that. 
and an upper branch of that. So again, this catheter size and reach allows for branch vein definition quite nicely. So we actually have the catheter uh, sitting in two distinct branches now in the right lower pulmonary vein, the upper and lower branches of that vein. And as I gently pull back, we'll define the antrum of the vein nicely. This is just underneath that vein there, Sid. Okay, you show me an AP, I'll, yeah, we'll get the rest of the septum here. We spoke earlier about signal definition with this catheter. And I think that integrated unipolar technology allows for um, really clear signal reduction in far field signal and the interelectrode spacing and electrode size in addition to number of electrodes allows for nice definition of the signals of interest here. The catheter shaft, similar to the ablation catheter, uh, we're looking at here, that red part of the shaft shows us which way we're going to deflect when we pull the plunger. And I find that to be very, very useful. Okay, so that way I always line up that color when I want to move in a certain direction. So here, for example, I have a gap in my anterior wall and I have the red color wheel there lined up where I want it to go. So if I'm not able to reach it with a sheath maneuver, for example, countering with the sheath, I'll deflect the catheter in the direction of that color wheel to help get to where I need to get to accurately. We've done uh, a number of head-to-head -head comparisons in the same case of pentaray versus octaray mapping, and uh, we found that there's improved signal resolution, uh, less noise. One of the other nice features about this catheter, when I deflect the catheter and put a curve on it, some of the challenges that we had with noise uh, previously with pentaray with catheter deflection have been significantly, significantly improved. We don't see a lot of that noise now. And, and uh, part of that, I think, is not only the construction of the catheter, but also um, having those electrodes uh, offset from each other so there's not intra-electrode chatter. And I would say from um, all of our workflow perspectives, you know, I'm asked quite a bit about, well, how did you guys get to a low fluoroscopy state? And I'll have to say it was never our intention to be a low fluoroscopy program. It was a natural byproduct of becoming efficient operators and understanding how to utilize the technology to its fullest advantage, both ultrasound and 3D mapping. What we're gonna do now is then proceed with our left atrial ablation. And I'll say that you know one of the, I think very important things is that doing the right thing in the right sequence and taking the time to map properly means that the actual ablation procedure goes very smoothly. So in our lab, um, the actual ablation piece to things to sell itself is, is a very uh, efficient and relatively short process because we've set things up correctly up front. Uh, I use a foot pedal for radio frequency ablation. I find that to be good for a couple of reasons, not only control, but also efficiency. And that way um, I'm not occupying one of our lab staff's time to come on and off the generator. So what we've done because the uh, patient is bradycardic is we're pacing the atrium at a faster rate than the intrinsic. That minimizes some cardiac motion. And then our anesthesia colleagues have uh, been gracious to work with us on utilizing jet ventilation, high frequency, low tidal volume ventilation. And you'll see that my ablation catheter now uh, has really minimal movement. And as I perform uh, wide antral ablation here, it minimizes uh, a lot of the adjustments and other challenges that we have with either respiratory or cardiac motion. So utilizing all the tools that I have, um, contact force allows me to make sure that we have proper tissue contact for adequate lesion delivery. We have the sheath visualized to allow us to make sure that we know not only our sheath catheter relationship, but also with manipulation of the sheath, um, I'm able to see where the system is located, catheter and sheath together. Uh, you'll see that when I manipulate the catheter, I'm often, uh, I have sort of a cross-handed technique here. My right hand is utilizing uh, sheath manipulation by turning the knob. I'm moving the ablation catheter with my left index finger and thumb. And sometimes I'll drive the sheath alone, sometimes I'll drive both together, sometimes I'll drive the ablation alone, but I have everything sort of under control and visualized to be able to move efficiently through the ablation process. I think that um, 
VisiTag has given us some quantitative um, information, which I, I find to be helpful, but I think that the key points of what is being quantitated for catheter stability, location, and contact force. And uh, I, I pay as much attention to that as I do the tag, if not more. Uh, and similar to uh, reaching a low fluoroscopy state, uh, the goal is not the tag. The goal is to put together the right pieces, which uh, then means that the, the tag or uh, in the previous analogy, lower fluoroscopy, all of that follows subsequently. It's about doing all the right things, all the small things, to get all those things to work together. So we're working toward making sure that we have a nice contiguous line, that we're delivering good lesions, and that um, we're aiming for an interlesion or a contiguous lesion distance, somewhere between one and a half to two and a half millimeters, roughly. Um, I think it's helpful when you're starting this, you'll see that we have the measurement listed there on the screen. Um, but you'll start to see, I think the more you do this, that I have part of the ablation catheter overlapping part of my previous point, about a third to half of the previous point. And you'll see that that generates a nice uh, intra-electrode distance, you know, roughly a millimeter or less. And that's what I try to aim for, for pulmonary vein isolation. A focus on index is, is not the point. It's doing the right things to get that tag and generate the index that you want, which naturally leads to getting that, that index. So it's, um, you know, it's sort of like driving a car in some ways. You don't point the front of the car where you want to go. You look down the road, right? And if you do that, then the front of the car is going to go where it needs to go. You can see here, because we took the time to set up our maps and define our anatomy and plan our ablation strategy that we're, you know, the, the work now really is um, from a catheter manipulation standpoint is reasonably minimal. We're moving contiguously from point to point in circular fashion around the pulmonary vein antrum. All right, so one thing that we do in our lab that um, one of our talented CASs uh, helped work with us on is using the ice catheter to image the phrenic nerve, the right phrenic nerve. Obviously, one of the complications we worry about during AF ablation is right phrenic nerve injury with anteroablation of the right veins. And so what I'm going to do here, using the three-dimensional map that I've created of the right atrium, is to position the ice catheter just about at the RA-SVC junction. I have the fan uh, visualized for the ultrasound. And now I'm just going to take a look at that junction between the SVC uh, and the right pulmonary, right superior pulmonary vein. And usually between them, in that course, we'll be able to see the very echogenic right phrenic nerve. It's a myelinated structure. It shows up nicely on ultrasound. Actually, we're looking at it right now. So we have found in our experience that um, we're able to define the course of the right phrenic nerve high to low in much more definition and detail than we're otherwise able to do just with high output pacing alone. We'll corroborate our findings with high output pacing in a moment, but that's a nice technique that um, I think uh, is a result of a nice collaboration of members of our lab. What I'm doing now is I'm putting the ablation catheter just adjacent to where we drew the phrenic nerve on our ultrasound map. We're gonna paste the phrenic nerve now and you'll see that we have phrenic nerve capture right where we knew we would based on the ultrasound map. So that's a confirmation that what we were seeing on ultrasound was in fact the right phrenic nerve. You can see how nicely the ultrasound based course of the right phrenic nerve correlates with high output pacing capture of the right phrenic nerve. What I'm doing with uh, this right antral ablation, you'll see I have the red curve pointed toward us, the force vector is pointed right at us, and I have the sheath visualized. Okay, good contact and stability, creating a nice lesion. I'll then, I'm just clocking the catheter up and moving to my next point. And if I need to adjust the force, I'm just deflecting with my D curve to make sure that we're contiguous and delivering a good lesion. I'm gonna use the sheath now to 
help improve my stability. This area outside the transeptal puncture at the right superior vein, anterior roof junction is almost straight up out of the transeptal. So having a sheath here is nice to improve that catheter stability. What I'm gonna do now is just use the sheath. I'm just gonna pull the system gently down and take me to my next point. Sometimes that may require a little bit of catheter deflection. But this is where the sheath really provides that stability on the posterior wall. You'll see right now we're ablating underneath the right inferior pulmonary vein. And with my left hand right now, I am countering to get anterior. And I have the red curve of the ablation catheter with the contact force vector facing me. If I want to apply additional force, I can deflect the D curve toward us to provide that contact. So I'm using the whole system in unison. Um, and often I'll, I'll do this as you're watching now or sometimes with a cross-handed technique where I'm countering the system anteriorly and using my left hand to spin the deflection knob uh, to help drive the sheath and ultimately the catheter tip into the position that I want. Post ablation for mapping purposes, you'll see that the splines uh, nicely straddle both the antrum of the vein here, we're across the roof and part of the posterior wall. Uh, so we're, we're sort of in multiple segments of the left atrium uh, because of its reach. And this is uh, a nice piece of efficiency. I think a beautiful example right now of that catheter is splayed open against the left atrial posterior wall. Let's paste that through, please. There's no signal in the octoray consistent with entrance block. We're going to check now for exit block. One of the um, pre-procedure workflows that we've gotten away from is CT or MR imaging prior to ablation. We used to do that routinely. We don't anymore because the um, integration of all the technologies means that we're very comfortable with defining anatomy, both from an ultrasound perspective and as you saw just a moment ago, um, we found that this catheter in particular will find all the branches of the pulmonary veins so that defining the antrum we think is accurate uh, and doesn't require any imaging, which is a, a big convenience to the patient and obviously uh, important for less utilization uh, pre and post procedure. We completed our procedure. We uh, performed a pulmonary vein isolation uh, with first pass bidirectional block for both the left and right pulmonary veins. After our initial ultrasound based mapping, uh, our very controlled ice based transeptal procedure and octoray based left atrial mapping, uh, generating 8,000 point pre and post ablation maps. Following ablation, we uh, perform program stimulation. We weren't able to induce any further arrhythmias and uh, I'm optimistic for this patient that his very symptomatic atrial fibrillation will be much improved post-procedure.